Hello again. So in the last lab, we saw how to REST enable a basic microservice. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at, first of all, how to apply a bit of security to that new microservice. And then we're going to explore the whole idea of scope. Um, this is really important when we start looking at the topic we're going to cover in the follow on lab, which is to do with context and dependency injection. So first of all, the service we've done so far, um, you may recall, if I just run this service again, let's go and start it off. Okay, run as Java application. Okay, so if I run this, you can see that we just get a response. Please notice, I mean, we don't have any security enabled on this. Now, first of all, we haven't enabled HTTPS. Um, the reason being because this would normally be something that would be deployed inside a Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so in that scenario, you're not likely to be doing HTTPS within the application. It'll be dealt with either in the ingress controller or maybe in a load balancer or an API gateway. However, you do quite often want to advise and put on things like basic security. So what we're going to look at is how we can do that. The security model we are going to apply is a very simple security model, which is based around the use of uh, a password file. Okay, it isn't even an encrypted password file. Now, there are multiple security models you can use with Helidon. This is obviously a useful one for testing. Now, you can also use a OAuth based protocol mechanism, and that's obviously the kind of thing you'd probably use in a production environment. So how do we authenticate? Well, it's actually really, really simple. We literally go and find the class that we want to authenticate, and we can do this on a per method basis, but it's easier just to apply it to the whole class itself, and we just do at authenticated. Oops. Oops. Oh, there we go. All right. So it's a single simple annotation. And what it will mean is that every time you call this class, it has to pass the authentication processes. Now, uh, let's just show how that works. Let's save that and run it. Okay. So in this case, we can expect to see this to fail. Okay. And the reason we can expect to see this to fail is because we're not providing a username and a password in the CURL command. As expected, we get an authorized. So if I now go in and add that to the CURL command, and you'll notice this is a really, really simple password just for test purposes. Oops, helps so I get the case right. Okay, you can see that this request net will now pass, and you know, obviously we can see we've got a response there. Now, a couple of points here. First of all, where are we getting that configuration information from? Well, we're actually pulling it out of a configuration file. We'll see how we bring configuration files into Helidon in a little bit. But for now, um, we can just have a look and we can see in the source code here, if I open the security configuration file, this is literally a provider very, very simple provider, it specifies three users, each of which has a password or password. And you'll notice that some of them have roles. Now, we'll go and have a look at what those roles mean later on. Um, but effectively, they allow us to separate users based on function. OK, so you can say somebody who is an administrator or somebody who is a user as opposed to just a general person. OK, um, so literally, it's as simple as that to apply a basic security model. Now, obviously, if you're using something like OAuth, there's a little bit more configuration than just saying a simple file like this. But the basic principles apply in both cases. You have a configuration that defines what the security model should look like. And then you implement that by basically just putting authenticated. Um, we can obviously put that on a method instead of the whole class. And we can also specify for particular methods what role, or actually the whole class, what role should be used when somebody accesses it. So there we go. Authentication actually turns out to be really, really easy. This is just one of the standard things that comes in with Helidon. OK, so the other thing we're going to look at in this particular lab session is we're going to have a look at scope of classes. OK, now this may sound a little bit of an odd thing to say. Um, 
And it's possibly going to be a bit confusing. So hopefully we will be able to explain this nicely. So if we have a look at our storefront class, OK, you can see here in our reserve stock item class, we have a little bit of action in place that basically says, I want to see how the, you know, the minimum number of items that can be reserved. Yeah, you know, and this is, let's say you're reserving paper clips, for example, you don't want to reserve uh, or let people take a single paper clip. You might want to limit it to a box or 20 or something. OK, so I know this is a slightly synthetic scenario, but effectively what we've got is we've got this object called a minimum change object. OK, and that has a field in it. It's actually a bean that has a get minimum change. OK, so we can make sure that this does work. So first of all, let's go and try and reserve some stock. OK, so let's go back on our service again. OK. Come on, little computer, you can do this copy and paste. One of the joys of working with VNC is it doesn't always copy and paste stuff properly. OK, so in this case, you can see that I've made a reserve request. Um, obviously, I've told it what the application content type is, the username. And in the data of the request, I res tried to reserve two items. OK, and you can see we've got an internal server error. Now, first of all, internal server error, not a lot of use in terms of understanding what's gone wrong. But we'll look at how we we'll handle that in a later section. If we have a look at the stack trace, you can actually see that um, the reservation of two items fails because it's less than the minimum number of items, which is actually three items. OK, so if I had gone through and I had tried to do this again, let's go and change this to three items. That works. We've now successfully reduced that. And you can now see in the log output, but we have successfully reported and reduced it down to three items. So the question is, how do we get that value for minimum change? Well, this is something that is dynamically injected into our code. We'll see about how that happens later on. Um, but first of all, we need to figure out how we're going to configure and manage that. So what we've got is we've got a little set of classes here that will allow us to configure our classes. And I just need to edit my application to tell it that it's also going to use a configuration resource. Now, again, in this particular case, I am doing this by hand um, because I want to very carefully and precisely control exactly which classes are enabled at any point in time because this is a lab and we're doing this step by step. In a production environment, you wouldn't do this. It will automatically, you would just use a default main method that's part of Helidon, and that would automatically go and search for all of the resource classes for you. So I wouldn't have to set this kind of thing up. I wouldn't have to start up a server in the main method and so on either. Okay, so let's say that. And if we very quickly have a look at the configuration resource class, you'll see it has a path. Um, it's request scoped. We'll talk about that in a moment. And it has a constructor and a couple of methods, get and set. OK, so if we run the program, now we will have that extra endpoint. OK, notice I haven't said that this is authenticated. So at this point, if I run this, have troubles getting these command lines right okay so you can see that it has returned a set of minimum changes of three okay so that's what we kind of expected and actually if you looked at the minimum change code the zero arguments constructor will create that with a default value of three okay so let's just show you that so um where is that that's in the data so yeah you can see if you call it with no constructors it then goes and sets it with a minimum change of three OK, um, what we're going to do now is we're going to try and change that configuration setting. OK, 
So let's go back to the resource. You'll see that there's another mechanism in here, okay, which is a post method, right? Um, and that produces JSON and so on. I have said that this method you must be authenticated to use, and you can only do it if you're authenticated with an administration role. Okay, so let's try doing this, and we can probably expect an error here. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my terminal. Okay, so I'm trying to set this to four, but it won't let me. Well, the reason it won't let me is because Jill is not an administrator. The only person who's an administrator here is actually Jack. So if I just change Jill for Jack, okay, and you can see that we've now changed it. So we've got a new response back. It actually says that the new value is four. And you can see in the log file that we actually successfully did that. Brilliant. But if I go and get it again, there's a problem here. It's reset back to three. Well, why is that? Well, the answer to that is to do with the way Helidon and similar frameworks actually dynamically create classes. Okay, so if we go and have a look at this configuration class, um, we can see here that this is something that is called request scoped. So when you access an endpoint, Helidon will examine the type of endpoint it is. Is it a request scoped object or is it something else which is called application scoped? If it's request scoped, the dependency and injection system, we'll get onto that in more detail later, um, will automatically create a new instance of this class every time a request comes in. Now, if you're using it within the same request, it'll you reuse the same class. But if you're not using it, if you've got two separate requests, which is what we just did, one for setting it, one for getting it, we create a new instance of this. Now, that's a bit of a problem because it means every time it's creating a new change instance of minimum change, and that new instance of minimum change is, of course, having a new value of three. So we need to go and make a little bit of change here. And what we're going to do is we're going to change this from request scoped to application scoped. OK, now what that means is that there is a single instance. It's created on a lazy creation basis for first time you access it. And that instance is reused every time it's needed. So if we now run this again, and we go back to our terminal, okay? So if we go and get the value, as we would expect, it comes back with a value of three. If we now go and rerun the set command, you can see it's come back as a value of four. And if we now reget the minimum change, you can see the new value has now stuck. So it's a new value of four. So this is something that's actually really, really important to understand. Um, when you are writing programs, you need to consider, is this something that the class instance needs to exist across the entire program, or is it something specific to each request? There are advantages to both. If it's something that runs across the entire program, then you can store state in that, as we have just seen. However, the difficulty is that means you also have to be aware there could be multiple simultaneous requests using that class, so it has to be written in a way that's thread safe. However, if it's request-based, you don't get to keep the state. You have to put the state in an external situation, however, an inter external storage mechanism. However, you don't need to worry so much about the multi-threading. So you need to think about which one to use where and when. OK, now. What we're going to also do just while we're here is we're going to do one other little change just to prepare for something we're going to do in the future. And I am going to add a status resource to our list of classes. And the idea here is that this will let us um, access status information just to see how the resource class is doing. So if we go and run that just to show you. OK, so there we go, that's running. Right. So if we go to the status endpoint now. 
Okay, you can see it gives us a little piece of information, tells us it, it does have a name, but it hasn't been set. Uh, it's alive, it's got a version and a timestamp and so on. Okay, so that's something we're going to be using later on. So what we've looked at here is how easy it is to apply a security model with very minimum changes to your code, literally just using the at authenticated annotation, how you can restrict users to particular roles so that only users in that role can access a method, and how we can use a configuration file to bring that information in. Here, we're using a very simple configuration file, but in a production environment, you would obviously use something a little bit more sophisticated that goes out to a proper external source. So thank you for your attention. What we're gonna look at in the next module is how we do configuration and dependency injection, and also how we can monitor our configuration and bring in external configuration information. Thank you. What you've just seen is based on a lab which goes through effectively using Helidon to create microservices from a monolith piece of code. This lab is available to anybody on the internet. Um, it's originally written to work in the Oracle Cloud, but you can take the source code from the Git repository and run it in your own environment. You can use a MySQL database or other databases if you want to. So what I'm going to do now is quickly show you how to get to the lab. Um, that will include links to where you can download the original template source code and obviously the content of the lab itself. So in a web browser, if you go to bit.ly slash go live labs, okay, and that will take you to the Oracle Live Labs starting page. Then search for using Helidon to create microservices from a monolith. Now that's gonna return two lab options. Um, the overall sequence of videos is based on the extended lab version, but if you don't want to do the extended stuff, you can just focus on the, the, the shorter version. Um, you basically just click the launch button and then if you want to run it on an Oracle trial, you can um, register for free trial environment. If you already have a free trial environment, you can then look at running it within that environment. Um, if you just basically click on that, you can then have access to the web page. Um, effectively, what you need to do, follow the instructions under getting started and set up your tenancy and set up for the Helidon Labs to get this working in the Oracle Cloud environment. Now, if you don't want to use the Oracle Cloud environment, then there are um, instructions on how to download the source code using the, or in the setup for Helidon Labs section. Um, You'll obviously need to make sure that you've got uh, Java 11 on your laptop. You're going to need to make sure that you've got a suitable IDE and so on. If you want to use a database other than the Oracle database, you can do that. But you'll need to configure the, um, the database uh, files so that you can ensure that it will work on the local database. And you know, that's basically through the JDBC and JPA, JTA settings in the meta inf folder. So thank you for that. Hopefully you will enjoy playing with that and uh, good luck.